Hello and welcome to Castle of Horror, the show dedicated to horror movies and awesomeness. This week, we are back. We are back after our um, little short break, and now we're back for the Halloween season. We're kicking it off with a look at the thriller Saloom, which is now available on Shudder. This here is episode 380. Bear in mind, if you haven't seen today's movie, we're going to be talking about it from the perspective of horror fans who have seen it. So warning, spoilers ahead. From Denver, Colorado, I'm your host, Jason Henderson, publisher at Castle Bridge Media, home of the Castle of Horror Anthology. With me from Austin is Tony Sabaggio, lead singer and bassist of the band Deserts of Mars and lead guitarist of the band Rise from Fire. Say hello, Tony. Howdy. Howdy. Also in Austin, Mr. Drew Edwards is the writer-creator of the long-running underground comic Halloween Man, currently published by Comixology. He is a Best Writer Ringo nominee, Austin Chronicle Best of Austin Award winner, and a member of the Penn America Fellowship. Say hello, Drew. Hello, Drew. Hello, hello. And finally, also in Denver, color commentary from the one and only just went on a wonderful trip to a to a wacko store that we got to talk about later during endorsements. The lovely and talented Julia Guzman of uh, Guzman Immigration of Denver. Say hello. Hello. How are you? Hello. I am excellent. I'm actually just directly downstairs from you. Right. Well, now. how are um, all of you? So anyway, oh, good. good. <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, we've been on a break. It's weird. It feels weird. Like if you take away the preparation for the show and the recording of the show, which is typically on Sunday, then Sundays feel weird, don't they? Or am I the only one that that happens to? Um, I always tell myself that I am going to do things on Sunday nights when we're not recording. Inevitably, I somehow get into my head that we're still recording, so I don't plan <laughs> anything for yeah, Sunday night. There. And so I, I, uh, so that's that's what happens to me when we when we don't record. So in other words, right. you may as may as well record is what you yes. Say. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um Saloom. This is a film that Tony Savaggio recommended because he caught it in the festivals. Um, Saloom mm. is a 2021 Senegalese thriller directed by Congolese director Jean-Luc Herbulat and produced by Pamela Diop. The film stars Jan Gale, Mentor Ba, and Roger Salah in the lead roles as a group called the Hyenas, an elite trio of mercenaries that is extract a drug dealer and his bricks of gold. And so far, we sound like we're in the plot of that's going to lead up to Miami Vice or something like that in the middle of a coup d'etat in 2003. Um, and it goes from that and it becomes a supernatural thriller. It made its international premiere in the Midnight Madness section of the Toronto International Film Festival in 2021. Uh, it won uh, the award for the best director in the next wave section at fantastic fest tony i think that's where you saw it yeah and yeah. uh won the audience award for most popular film in the altered states program in the 2021 vancouver international film festival so uh, this was a very very well received um non we we actually don't watch a lot of non-american movies we occasionally venture into into european films this is definitely i believe the first senegalese film that we've seen so yeah. um let's get our opening thoughts we'll go tony julia drew and then i'll go um you know give us your short opening thoughts but tony i'm i'm really interested in knowing how it is that you brought this film to us well, I think I did, you know, capsule review of it last year at Fantastic Fest. Um, I, you know, I'd seen the the promos. It looked kind of cool. And I was really impressed at just how well it works. I, I just, I love world genre cinema. I love world mm -hmm. cinema, but world genre cinema really <laughs> hits me, you know? And that's one thing I love about Fantastic Fest. I hope I today, tonight, I don't lay it on too thick because I'm about to go to Fantastic Fest and watch more movies and bring those reviews back to us you know, back. Uh, and in fact, I won't be on the regular Sunday uh, for the next couple of weeks, um, but or at least the next. I had forgotten week. that we'll, for the we'll next week. To, yeah, we'll have it's to fine. either find a sub or we'll just we'll just be one man short. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's OK. So we'll be fine. But I I just I really love, you know, the genre bending gets used as a term a lot. And I just really liked how this film does that. I think one thing I love about world cinema cinema is, is to see somebody tell their tale that's very much theirs. Like, I think this director and this cast, this is the perfect, like, I want to see this tale told. 
right? Mm. And I think that that's amazing. I love to see that. And I also, it's interesting to see the Western influences, action influences, especially, you know, this is a very uh, post, definitely post Tarantino, post uh, several other action directors, you know, I could, uh, you know, Guy Ritchie kind of, and not that they're, they're like those, but just the, we live in a world where the influences all kind of go back and forth. Yeah. And to see this put together in, you know, you kind of, there's little bits that you're like, oh, well, that has a flavor of this, you know, this kind of Hollywood thing, but maybe not our, maybe, you know, European thing, but then told in a totally different way, mm -hmm. uh, you know, by, by this crew, by this, you know, the filmmakers here. And I just, I thought it was great. And I love the the turn that we can talk about. And I kind of thought a little bit more about that when we when we get to that. Um, but yeah, it starts out as kind of one thing. And it is, you know, John Rabinning. It's got a lot of great characters. Uh, I, I found it fascinating. And I was really couldn't wait to bring it now that it's on shutter so mm -hmm. many more people can see it and it's beginning good reviews i see people mentioning it all the time on twitter and i was just hoping that all of you would also like it like mm -hmm. it's important to me when i bring something like I'm like oh no what if you know what if somebody else in the cast doesn't like it but i i just really dig it and i'm really happy that that more and more people can see it now that it's uh streaming on shutter that's excellent excellent uh wow uh, Julia, what are your opening thoughts? <clears throat> um, I thought it was really interesting. Um, I don't know why Tony, you would think that I wouldn't like it because I'm, a, I, there was, it's not gory and I was a French major, so I love French movies. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was definitely something that I was interested in. Um, awesome. yeah, but, uh, yeah, it was very it's, it's odd to have it be kind of in two chunks or really three, but you know, it's like that first part where you're just kind of like, this is a horror movie. What? And then it's like, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, yeah uh so it was, that was kind of kind of unusual um but yeah i like the characters i thought the effects were really interesting once they finally did kind of when it does become a horror movie and up until then it's pretty suspenseful like you're kind of like what's going you know what's going on what's really happening a couple of interesting twists which i always enjoy um so yeah uh i thought i, I actually enjoyed it uh quite a bit awesome fantastic uh, Drew, what about you? Uh, I also really enjoyed it. Um, primarily, I think, oddly, not for like the character stuff or even the monster stuff. I think I love the scenery. Like any oh, it's so beautiful, that, right? Yeah, like anytime they would do a drone shot, like looking down at something, it just it just was. A lot of scenery porn is what you know yeah. what, what, what they would say is in this one. Um, yeah, uh, you know it's it's a a beautiful film. It's interesting. You know, it's definitely you know in in some ways it reminded me not that it's tonally like this, but it did remind me a bit of From Dusk Till Dawn the way yeah. the 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 genre. Uh -huh. uh, it starts out as like a, a crime movie, and then and then completely you know got, pull, pulls a 180 towards the climax of the movie but yeah uh you know i i had fun watching it um i think my my only criticism like like major criticism and this isn't actually a criticism of the movie itself but i feel like sometimes the translation on shutter wasn't exactly like it somehow oh, wasn't getting that. getting the the what 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 the con conveying what the characters actually were saying and mm -hmm. in a few places um because there was a couple times and, and if, unfortunately now it's been a couple of days since i watched it but there was a couple times i felt confused by the the subtitles but um sure. thankfully thankfully this is a movie that is that is mostly told visually and i feel like even if you don't have the subtitles you could sort of tell what was going on anyway because it's it's just put together that way so yes. i i really i really enjoyed it and i would definitely recommend it to to not just fans of of horror cinema but people who right. like foreign film as well yeah and action it's a you know it's the action part is good the horror part is good the the emotional weight is also good and you know what it's trying to bring you know the the trafficking and how these guys operate and what they're trying to fight against like all of that is extremely poignant yeah, they're uh, the real in ones. a way 
in a way that isn't always seen in every horror movie. like the 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 way like, again that's kind of why i was talking about um not to get in front of jason but just seeing somebody tell this story mm-hmm. and have it mean something that's that's why i love just like oh that's how this is you know and, and i so much world cinema that's why it is why i love fantastic fences getting exposed to, to something like this i uh, sad that it took a year <laughs> for them to you know land a deal well that's that i mean and that's often the case I, it, you know oh yes yeah. luckily sometimes it has a happy ending where you're, where you're like oh finally i get to talk about this movie um why tony um and anybody else can answer it you know why is it interesting and why do you think as an artist it's particularly interesting to look at art that's coming from other parts of the world like in this case it's senegalese it's in french you know, uh, and and uh, it's it's so completely outside the bounds of, you know, I was just watching a trailer for a slasher movie set in Los Angeles. It's, it's a, you know, this is way outside the bounds for that. I mean, what do you think? What, you, you said, I love world horror. Why is that? Because culturally it kind of for me it's a recharge it's a it's a way of rewiring your brain it's the same way that they say well as you get older you should do puzzles or you should Mm -hmm. do learn a language it fires up those synapses that maybe you wouldn't you can't break out like you watch enough like you can get into a rut where you're just watching some similar things even if they're good things right or even they're comforting things Mm-hmm. Um, it's it, just to see someone tell a tale that involves different things culturally, or a different mm-hmm. view, or a different mirror. Again, we you know we talk a lot about how you hold the horror horror holds a mirror to to these things that we want you know we would like to confront, yeah. or maybe we don't want to confront normally, but we can do that through cinema. And I think you know, and all, like all the best directors, I mean, we get Star Wars because there was Flash Gordon mm-hmm. and Kurosawa, right? Like we didn't just get Flash Gordon, we yeah. got kurosawa mixed in with that and that's that not the only director i just named i named pop yeah culture, no like, you're right huge pop culture swings right mm-hmm. that without some of the kurosawa stuff it might not be what it is so you have every you know in french new wave cinema affected you know even in some of the most hollywood hollywood stuff there's there's bits of that and it gives you a different it's just more colors in your palette if you're a creator and you can appreciate and you know maybe it's not to say that you have to do that but i think seeing different perspectives um in the same way that travel changes most people and it depends like you can watch something that's that's similar and you can get that and it, that's kind of like if you go on the, the very constricted bus tour of an area. Sure. Or if you kind of do a little bit more on your own, kind of searching around, which, you know, can be cool or can be dangerous. But I think all but all those things make it up, right? Like all those things make up that experience. And I think that cinema from the more you watch, if you're a creator of things from all over, you get these different perspectives. I agree. And, 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 that, and- that's what solidifies. It, it adds just little hinges. and. You know, of course, somebody else may they may look to Hollywood or they may look to to American independent film and go, "Wow, well, I you know, I'm gonna I like lifting those things, you know." And so we end up with this cross pollination. I think that's amazing. It, and I I often don't think about I I think always in terms of going back and forth on the timeline, but I forget to go I forget to go outside of Europe. You know, I mean, I, I'm always like, oh, here's an interesting Italian film I've never seen, but I, I, I just, they're blinders on. And so this challenge, this challenges me to take those blinders off. Should, okay. Getting into the, come to in, Fantastic Fest to get, like, just hang no, out for one sure. year. For sure. Uh, the, um, but yeah, to, to get into it, the first thing I'd, I'd want to talk about is uh, the relationship of the hy- hyenas. So Drew said, these guys are a lot like the characters at the beginning of Dust Till Dawn. And that's so totally right because they are essentially, you know, they're international criminals, sort of famous. They move like ghosts through coups d'etat in order to do missions. And, and you know, they help out coups here. They hurt them there. And in this case, they're moving through this bloody and violent. Um, okay, not, not to be total snob, but just coup d'etat is going to be fine, even if it's more than one. <laughs> okay. All right. Well said. Um, multiple oh. coup d'etat. They, they, but they, they move through one at the beginning here. And their own their only purpose is not to, you know, help the coup or help the, the government or whatever it's just to extract a mexican drug dealer and haul his ass back to mexico that is their that's their mission that they open up with and what what i love about these guys relationship 
is how real it feels you know mm -hmm. like there's a moment because we can skip around in this conversation there's a moment later on when they all put their foreheads together and it's like a lot of moments in like uh dust till dawn or like in the wild bunch when mm -hmm. when all those guys think they might go out and die it's wonderful you really love seeing these guys like it's, working together it's the best of that camaraderie that you only get if you've been you know i don't want to be part of coup d'etat like right. death squad but you can get some of that camaraderie if you've been through you know some like something like hey we have deadlines and stuff like that not nearly that's not nearly the same but these guys have that camaraderie you will see in uh, you know war movies uh you know action uh, spy movies where they've been doing this so long that you you don't survive as a team through all the things they've survived through if you don't have that camaraderie and yeah. that ability. And, and you know, and th they have just, it's just written so well and done so well that the, and they have such chemistry that that shorthand is instantly upon us, you know? Like, yeah, these guys, they know what they're doing and they've been doing this a while. You just get that instantly. And yes. that's, and it doesn't feel very forced because, you know, I've seen a couple movies lately where I found them to be pretty or, or well filmed but the the relationships and the dialogue was felt kind of forced yeah i'm a, and i'm a genre like i i will watch and not you know i still love cheesy stuff but there's a way that you can uh construct that mm -hmm. that feels like this and you know it's I, amazing you know talking about the relationships there is something that really um stood out to me in the latter half of the movie that, uh, that, that I, I would like to know what other people's thoughts were. So please, sure. when we get to talk, start talking about the big reveal, please okay. remind me to come back to this topic of their relationships. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to make a note there. Um, so, all right. Um, what happens in the film that they're, as mentioned, they're supposed to extract this uh, drug dealer and take him to a larger port. I can't remember which port they're trying to get to. But uh, for whatever reason, while they're flying, they believe they've been shot in the, tank, in the gas tank because they're leaking fuel. And they have to put down near this place called Saloon. And it, it turns out that they've, that, you know, that they're leaking fuel because uh somehow it's or another been sabotaged. they've been, they've okay. been sabotaged okay that, yes. that that's that's i was gonna wait till we get to that but so it did and maybe somebody has a workaround but it did bug me mm -hmm. that these guys seem so tight and yet this guy comes up with this convoluted way to get him and his comrades to to end up in this particular spot which for, by the way could have actually just killed all of them and yeah <laughs> um i don't know why he didn't just say hey guys you know because i want to i want to go take revenge they had a very important gold and drug dealer guy but do, it, do it do it do it do it separately from that that's a good Say, point it, it at is some point i some, some i think yeah, yeah it's a good point to, yeah. to me it the impression i get and um you know i don't know if i'm gonna win the no prize on this is that <laughs> this is a he sees the opportunity in this this uh caper brings the opportunity to uh well actually you know what now that i think about it I'm going to describe it. I'm going to, this is, this is the, the crux of the message. Actually, mm. he has seen the opportunity to take revenge, right? By yep. maneuvering this, the crux, a big part of the movie, uh, you know, subtext that becomes higher, that becomes text is the nature of revenge. I mean, we, we start with a, a speech about revenge, yes. right? So the, they have this camaraderie and he is willing to break that, uh, and he's, he's got a plan like in his plan he cuts you know he cuts into the fuel tank enough that it's not gonna really kill them yeah he knows he, he kind of has this idea so the they are tight but what they're trying to say is no matter how tight this group is his need for revenge jeopardizes all of that mm -hmm. yeah it's an all-consuming inner thing which leads him to have a heist on top of a heist right yes well, how many times how many times in life do you do do you make an assumption and then your friends and your or your family or whoever cares for you goes you know you could have talked to me right. about this <laughs> yeah. yes and you're like that's, a, oh. that's an excellent point yeah 
I mean, the yeah. other the other one, and I I hate so uh, there's there's two that I, that I can say. One, he may not tell them because he. Or, you know, he wants to get revenge on somebody who's in this port that he's forced them to land at. He and needs he doesn't to keep want that to be a... talked down from it, too, is the other thing. Right, right. Exactly. He, he might have talked to those guys and they might but have been like, But these guys are desperados. True. We're not going to yeah, talk them out of well, yeah. but... like, no, nah, this isn't a thing. What I was, was going to su suggest was, because he has to keep it a super secret, um, he may just not want to even involve them in the extra trouble yeah. of the secret. So that's number one. Right. But number two, I mean... So the movie can happen. I mean, that's yeah, yeah, what yeah, yeah. that's that's what the movie. <laughs> I mean, is. that's the Ryan George answer. That but... is that is that is an answer. But I I no, I, I like my first I... answer better. The, well, the I fight. thought I I saw it as the all-consuming need for. The, well, I go with Jason too because if he if he he hopes that he could just do the revenge part and not involve them and everything will work out. We buried the gold. It's gonna be good. We get you know we'll get all the tools. We'll make it back. Like nobody could have un like no one could have predicted the twist right right so but also the other thing is that he decides to use the gold to further his plan so that's part right. of it too is that yeah. they might be like okay like you know if maybe this was the only time he was going to have a plane and be able to get near this place exactly and tell them oh let's stop and do this on the way they're gonna be like no we need to get our gold and our drug lord where they need to be yeah. uh they, they might have said no and then maybe they weren't gonna have a plane after that yeah we come into this high this is the height where he goes oh now I can shoot my shot. Like right. if if I can do the revenge caper on top of this extraction heist, mm -hmm. now this is the one. This takes me the closest. It makes the most sense. Our flight plan goes close to it. All the things. If I can, it all I, falls in I line. can't. Yeah, it all. Like if I do this right, I get. We get. I get it all. Mm -hmm. And it's not so much of an actual betrayal, it, even though it sort of is. But in his mind, like also, I think you assume. A, if I get them in on it and they, they might talk me down or they might not go along with it, then where am I at? But like if, you know, by the end of it, we'll, we'll be okay, hopefully, you know. And also, I suppose there's the possibility that what if we don't make it out of this whole gold drug lord right, heist? Right. And so I won't have gotten to have my revenge before I die, exactly. which is really important to me. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, I think it works. It's fine. But I, I hear you. Yeah, so, I, I agree with, I understand you're coming from, Drew. But those are, it's, it's, that it's, was all the things in my head that I was fine with it, you know? And I'm not trying to poke holes in the movie. Of course. I'm really no, not. No. Like, like, because this is, this is not, uh, uh, you know, th this is, this is, uh, you know, the, the, so the movie can happen answer is a fair answer sure. in my opinion, but like, it is something that I was thinking about while watching the movie. And other than that, be unfortunately, because I was like, so enamored with it and like, so watching it, like, I don't know that I have as much like thought put into this as, as I, you know, well, would have another movie because it just, it just was. Well, just that's okay. I mean, we'll we'll work our way through, um, because uh, the, luckily the next piece is they get to this saloon, and what's interesting is I've never seen this before. I want to rip this off somewhere. It's neat. They land there, and the place they're gonna hole up, you know. And remember, the other two Chak Chaka's like, "Hey, there's a resort over here. We can go to this resort." Um, the other two guys are like, "Oh, well, whatever." And yeah, uh, it's it it is a resort. I've never seen anything like it. It's a it's a set of bungalows. Um, you got a bunch of like Birkenstock type people who are staying there. A lot of people who are traveling through. So some are like literally on vacation. Some are like just traveling from place to place. And it's one of these places where you pay what you want and you have to do chores while you're staying there. That is a hilarious place to put three, uh, you know, warlords. Basically, it, yeah. it is. Because, you know, just you can picture like if Wolverine wound up here and so Wolverine's going to have to go fishing for a day, you know, because he's hiding out in this in this little resort. Yeah. Hey, use your claws, cut some, you know, right. cut some vegetables. Or, it's so, you, you know, know, it it's, you know, they eat at this big table and, you know, uh, uh, the movie masterfully gives us this guy named Omar, who is this big, uh, you know, boisterous loud laughing seemingly very spiritual leader um of the of the resort and he's the guy who welcomes them in and and uh yeah and he has seems all to be like together. such a nice such a nice guy he's a he's neat he's neat the character absolute worst well before we know he's the worst he seems like the best yeah. you know and 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 uh you know i i love all of this uh uh 
you know, because places like this do exist, by the way, Jason. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. I've known, I have known people that have literally like their va vacation is like, I'm going to go work on this farm. And I'm sure. like, I grew up around farms. <laughs> yeah, Why man, would I'm you not. do that? <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've shucked more butter beans while, having, exactly. while watching cartoons because though my stepdad was like, well, if you're going to watch cartoons, First, Here, go snap get some up beans. early, snap some beans, or that's else like, no that's cartoons. Like what a, and I'm I like, think it's what oh. a, like a, kib a kibbutz is, and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's that's I could live my whole life and never handle either snapping beans or any anything to do Smelling, with bailing, chucking corn, none of that. I, yeah. I have no desire. Yeah. Jason and I are both generally opposed to manual labor. If I'm <laughs> it drives rain, it drives rain crazy because she'll want to do like gardening stuff, and I'm like, uh, uh, no. I mowed, I mowed acres. I fixed fence. I or I smashed potato bugs because we didn't want to use pesticide. I picked potatoes. I did all like have whatever I, goes I got, on in I the backyard you. is have whatever. You, I'm sure the, the answer may be yes, but have you ever just for fun? Hunted would bees with a two by four. I, no. I don't know if this. <laughs> that's, that's a that's a that's a Jason and, and right up, there. Do you know what it's like to be stung by a hundred would bees? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, have you ever put your face into a would be hive? So a would a would be a, <laughs> a would be is nearly the size of a weevil wobble. It's an enormous. No, bee. I know, I know, and, and I've never no, <laughs> I have. Not They're very that. slow and lumbering. It's remarkable to me they can lift themselves that high into the air. Follow up number two. Do you know how much it costs to go to the emergency room with a hundred? <laughs> with <laughs> would be injuries. <laughs> I'm just telling you that you can <laughs> whack them with a board. You can take a board and just go wonk and knock a and knock these bees to the ground. I don't know, you know. So that's well, we're learning a lot about Jason today. Yeah, <laughs> with the this is one hunter. of those do not try this at home. Type this is what yeah. eleven year old. Also Jason now I'm a, I'm a definitely of a more live and let live. Like you know, as a kid you don't think about these things, but I'm definitely now the like. Hey spider, let's not let the cat get you or or be here. It's, you know, it's let's an put you out. Let's put you outside. Whereas yeah. when you're a kid, you're like, oh, it's a would be. I mean, what what could be the harm in chasing it with a board and smacking <laughs> it out of the air? Like, <laughs> but, yep. Uh, how awful. You're right. We're going to have listeners write into us. And he also I was... blew up action figures, all the um the kid from Toy Story. Oh, uh, I'm pretty sure. I think a lot of <laughs> I think a lot of guy like I'll I'll cop to like yeah you know especially knockoff action blew them like, up. knockoff GI Joes are fair game for when when it's Ju July seventh or so you know. <laughs> Let me, tell you, though, as well. let me tell you, yeah. though, that a an original Kenner action figure, the ones that were made of thick rubber, they yeah. will take a shotgun blast to the torso without <laughs> a considerable damage. We are learning so much unlike, more. Unlike Jason. <laughs> who yeah. uh, has learned the And then you can, throw, you can throw those pieces at a would-be. Yeah, there you go. Anyway, yeah. In, wow. A would-be is so Jason, big. I think Jason should start a folk rock band called the Wood Beasts. Oh yeah, that would be great. That that really does sound like, like a Jerry idea. Garcia side project, doesn't it? Um, okay, <laughs> or, or like a it's a Beatles uh, not a Beatles um, cover band. If there is oh, anyone, the Wood Beatles. Oh gosh, gosh, yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> If there's if there's anybody actually still listening, the uh, we, I'm sorry for you. They're sitting <laughs> they're sitting at the table at this resort, and we meet everybody because we meet Omar, the guy who runs the place. We meet we meet his uh, his sort of lieutenant whose name is escaping me right now. Uh, it's um it, it's either Salomon or Suleiman because those are two different people. Um, we, we so we meet his, the lieutenant. I'll just call him that. We meet the police detective. Who comes in because he's just hanging out uh and i believe is technically looking for the hyenas but uh but um, yeah he, is. he doesn't recognize yeah. our guys necessarily as such mm, we meet this no, he, woman he does <laughs> he definitely does he, he for sure he absolutely knows who they are like almost immediately it's just that he's got to yeah. like, confirm it and we meet uh we meet this woman who is uh, deaf and does not speak, but she knows exactly who they are. And in a detail that I think is just kind of wonderful, she speaks to them in sign language, yeah. which is incredible. 
I, and they I, don't speak doesn't sign ex- language. Doesn't expect uh, them to speak back with that. I that's a great and that's a great scene too. Where yeah, like, oh okay, and they're talking you're like oh, and the other guy's like oh no, they're just saying they're just conversing, and she's threatening like you know yes. I can turn you in, but it's a very else, tense like, oh, scene. Yeah, yeah, it's great, man. Oh, it's well, and Omar is like, turn. you really need to tell us all what's going on or maybe it's right the captain. yeah because you're being <laughs> rude yeah, and, yeah. and and talking when we can't hear you these two people are talking in sign language at the table and the scene is very tense when you think about it what is the what does the, the scene have to accomplish in the script the scene has to just accomplish that uh chaka is going to meet this girl she's going to say I, I know who you people are and i would like uh to to come with you or i'll expose you all that could be done in a really boring scene in like the pool hall nearby but instead it's done right there at the table and it causes this tension because everybody's having to just sort of wait patiently while they have this conversation right. just, and that was character. cool and it's great because it establishes why she's important to the once things flip yes with yeah that's know, right being, being deaf yeah absolutely being deaf Boy. is an important part of when it flips and yeah and so that also like that for us it's a, just a tense moment because everybody's like why are they you know what's going on here and then when it flips you're like ah oh, Oh wow! Okay, that's a different. That's a layer that I hadn't anticipated. Yeah, yeah. So. She's such a great character, though. I love. Oh, her. she's so great. Yeah, she's fantastic. What is the What is this actress's name? Does anybody know? I I don't. <clears throat> I don't see it. In um, time. it says Evelyn Ily Juen or Juen. Ah, Evelyn mm-hmm. Ily Juen. Okay, the character is Awa. Yeah, yeah. Just fantastic. Um, I, I like her. She's funny. She can do so much with her face. You know, uh, most most of it just showing her general distaste for whoever she's talking yeah. to, and it's it's it is it's good. Um, so uh, you know, the the next twenty minutes or so are just taken up really with uh, the chores of uh, of the resort where people. You know, and, uh, you know, they they begin to demonstrate some of the side deals that are going on that the police officer is really intending to intending to arrest the uh, the hyenas. Awa wants to run off with the hyenas and she find we find out that she regards them as something more like folk heroes. Uh, yeah, she calls them heroes. Yeah, because she's picked out the parts of their resume that that are that we call on the side of good but they're chaotic i mean that they'll they'll do whatever it is that they're that they're going to do we can skip forward really to when the film makes a big old turn with just like half an hour to 40 or so minutes left in the movie when we realize what's really going on we've gotten hints of it in flashbacks and so forth up to then which is that i think it's really the halfway point but yeah okay chaka uh you know who is ostensibly the leader of of the hyenas Chaka uh, actually grew up at this resort when it was previously a little bit differently situated. He was a child soldier, uh, captive. He was sexually abused by Omar, this guy who seems like such a nice guy. And he has come back to get his revenge on Omar because he was not able to take it um, out of fear, out of weakness, whatever. Wasn't able to take it when he was a kid. And again, we see the layers of of the reveal being that the evil or the the parts that overtake us uh, build there. So you know, his is his is his buried thing is revenge. Yep. Omar's is being this horrible mm-hmm. you know warlord abuser, yeah, abuser, and and made you know. There's some great dialogue at the beginning. It was like, oh. You know, I think we've been here. Oh, I don't remember you. Mm-hmm. He's like, and, I met and, you a long time ago, and he's yeah. like, I have a, perf- I have a uh, photographic memory. I think I would remember. And he's like, No, I know you. And mm. and that sets that seed. So when when the reveal happens, it's even more like, Wow, you were such an abuser, and this is how you've chosen to to uh, you know, you you've forgotten all this. Well, I haven't forgotten. Um, and there's those layers to everybody that that's really great. Well, yeah. and uh, um, and we'll when when the reveal happens in just a few minutes, we'll reveal an extra angle to that. So so he has kept this Remington uh, revolver that that Omar held 
because back then he was known as I think Colonel Remington or something. And yeah. so so Chaka shoots the guy as many times <laughs> as he has rounds in the gun. After and... after after doing big, giving a big speech at the table in front of everybody. Well, yes. and, but but leading up to the, the chore part is where they you know there's parts where where different factions of this group bond because they're sent out to do that's right things yeah. like you know mm-hmm. to do to for missions for for some of them and you know of course our our drug dealers like uh, useless at at farming uh and being forced to that and but the, those you know, it is important that the the bonding between uh everybody happens on these uh you know, missions out out from the from saloon mm-hmm. so we you know we get a we get a lot more layers there too well, I mean, Omar, for instance, has this kind of a funny uh, chore that he takes one of the guys on where they go and they use BB guns to shoot in the ass some guys who yeah. are disrupting local fishing by using explosives. Right. And, and they're a bunch of white dudes. And so they, they we don't even see the scene. It's not particularly important. They, they skip over it. There's laughing about it afterwards where right. they, they, they shot those guys in the butt and apparently made them run away. And... And that's funny. And that's actually right before Omar gets shot. So right. uh, it's, which but is it's also, because of that, like, hey, we're bonding. This is great. Oh, you, yeah. we did all that and you still don't remember. Okay. Yeah. You know, that, that, like I said, it's, it's a very multi layered film. Um, well, and that's and, also reminds me of Tarantino a lot. You yeah. know, like when you think of like the turns that happen in, um, in, in Glorious Bastards or, or, sure. you know, exactly. where, where characters will just switch, kind of switch roles in, in where they are. Um, you know, like the scene, um, the scene of the Nazis and the allies in the bar, which keeps sort of flipping who's in charge and, and who's losing and so forth. Um, and, and yeah. you know, that's rightly so. That's kind of why I pointed that out. What I find fascinating is how the, again, about world cinema is the interplay between what we think of, you know, I don't, I didn't get to do an interview on, Hey, what were your influences? You know, what, what did you watch? But you can, if you're looking, it, it would appear, and it could be just because this is what we're exposed to the most. Mm. Um, you know, you may say, Oh, well, there's all these French films that I watched. Those are my action. You know, that was my action education. Sure. But if you watch it, like I'm watching it from my own perspective and I'm thinking, Oh, well, you know, there's, there's some Tarantino, I think Rodriguez, you know, like, uh, yeah. Reads, pointed out like all these not just that of course it's broader than that but sure but if you're looking at it that's what i love is you'll see things like oh well that came from the west and then you know how we how we spin things around how we ingest things and spin them out i think is that's what fascinates me uh and i think it's it's great like you'll pick up these pieces i you know i have seen a lot of cinema lately really some of it successfully some of it not uh pick up like even some shaw brothers kind Mm -hmm. of our our golden harvest kind of action some people do it better than others and i've seen that even in in uh you know some korean and and japanese cinema uh pick up a little bit here and there and i go oh i i I bet that that filmmaker saw this this and this you know Mm -hmm. And, and that's cool so while i can't say for sure you know what what all the influences were to, we kind of pick up on that, and that I think makes it interesting. It's it's wonderful actually to me when you see a quotation like that. I I I feel like, and we can't be sure, for sure that this is a quotation, but we were talking a few weeks ago about De Palma and and Potemkin and all that stuff, and yeah. I uh, I feel like there are people who see quotations and they are annoyed or they 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 instantly dismiss something, and I. For me, that just brings me great joy. If I see, <laughs> and, if I, and it, it, you know, not to go too far afield from the movie, but I also feel like um, it's how people use them. Mm. Some people will say, "I am going to use, uh, you know, light and shadow. I'm going to use chiaroscuro this way." Yeah. And other people go, "I'm going to repaint that <clears throat> painting." Like some people go, "Oh, I'm going to repaint that painting," and that's yeah. okay. But other people will go, "Well, this." section of the painting needs some heavy light and shadow but over here it needs some pointillism yeah and somehow those things aren't disparate yeah when the painting is made and i yeah I, that's i don't know if that's a good analogy or not but that's how i view it in my head and and you know I, i've seen it where it's not even homage it's just like oh that's that scene and you're gonna do this okay and and sometimes that's fine but i well i've, I've I heard love it of... when it's masterful and like <gasps> Mm, that's a pretty good deep cut that's like, yeah but it but it, it 
retelling things in your own uh style like adapt like taking a style and kind of massaging it into your own uh you know that's the fascinating part for me and and that kind of separates uh masters of their craft and you don't have to be but boy when it works it's so great yes uh okay so we've put off the reality long enough they kill he kills omar everybody's like no holy crap you killed omar and then that is the moment when we switch because we find out through through a couple of things that happen very rapidly that Omar uh, Omar was basically holding. Uh, I, I almost shudder to say this because it's going to sound more stupid than it is. <laughs> Omar was holding a bunch of demons at bay. Omar was use, was at you know holding down his occupation at this resort and doing whatever magic was needed to hold demons at bay. We find out later, by the way, he was doing it. And this is another twist. He was, um, and Drew, this is your point. I think you, you wanted to make a comment here. Omar is holding those demons in bay by abusing children. Isn't that shocking? Isn't that crazy? And they are understood and said over and over again to be child soldiers. That where we take the reality of children who are pressed into military service and we turn it into a symbol where they are literally being being abused and exploited to serve a the monster. devil. To serve yeah, the devil, but... to serve demons, to serve right. you know, demonic forces. That's you know, on the nose when you say it like that, right? But it it, it works wonderfully, uh, you know, in in the film. And it, it so this time I watched it, I almost felt like the "oops, you didn't know you were keeping a demon at bay" had a almost King, hmm. like Stephen King, kind of twist in a way. And again, I'm not saying that that they did that, but it felt like it felt more that way. But then hmm. by the end of it, it's more Barker because of the child soldier kind of thing. And again, not that I have to put these labels on things, but it just, all these things start to float through my head as far as my touchstones to horror. Oh, know? absolutely. And, and it felt like this time I got, for some reason, I got like this weird kind of almost king vibe at the at the part where you're like, you don't even know what you just did. Right. <laughs> kind, of, kind of thing. I don't know. I, I, maybe that was just me, but I, you know, this is my second time. And, you know, the first time I saw it was like a year ago. So I'm paying attention to different things this time. I'm letting my mind wander a little bit. And just, I don't know, something about that felt that way to me. But I could be in the minority on that. I don't know. What were you going to say, Drew? I wanted to know, and and this, this could have been just another lost in translation thing. But the rules of these monsters, it's never 100% established and mm. like you know I, I got i got that they could they can't follow you indoors for some reason and my thing though that i, I kept again why this don't you is, go I, into what you think the rules are and then we'll slowly well I, I i can tell you what i was i was unclear on is probably easier for me because yeah. they did not look solid but then they could be shot or stabbed yeah and, that part was tricky for me as well Uh, Because clearly there's some kind of psychic monster because they can get into your brain as long as you can hear them, which is why the deaf chick is protected and why they're protected when they wear the the heavy duty construction headphones, uh, headsets. But um, but yeah, I'm with you that the the fact that they were physical enough to be able to be shot was also puzzling to me. And I would have been fine with it so much as, you know, monster, monster movie logic goes if they had just slowed down this part of the movie for just a second to, to have Johnny exposition just well, explain they have the rules. A wave at that. They say something like, uh they say something like if they are physical then they can be killed. Right. They're, well, they're it's, free, it, they're if, if, if it bleeds them. it can kill it line yeah. basically. Yeah, and I think the idea is they trade the physicality of attacking you for the potential that they're vulnerable. I would also like to to know more. You know, I wish I could have gotten some interview. I wish I could have done that. I should have uh, at the time last year to know how much of this is made up and how much of this is rooted. You know, I need to do some more research into how much of this is rooted in kind of more folklore. Mm. That's the other thing is is about world cinema. Like uh, if you see something like Tombad or, or you know a bunch of different, there's a bunch of stuff from you know watching you know movies from the philippines or whatever or you know different hong kong movies or uh movies from taiwan the the cultural folklore aspect to horror and regional folklore horror uh it's you know 
especially outside of Europe. That's another thing that fascinates me, like how mm-hmm. you take these childhood tales and turn them into your own movie. And you mm-hmm. know, oh yeah, well, growing up, this was a thing, and you know, we learned this story. I I'm such a huge mythology buff and and co- uh, cultural both both the differences in mythology and the the through lines that we all kind of have together, like, you know, ghosts, some kind of vampire, you know, all this stuff where we, oh, we have this kind of vampire. Oh, okay. If I call the vampire, it's this. And I, I am endlessly fascinated. I could study, you know, leave me in a library full of that. I'm, or you know, along with the oh, I, projector, and I'm. Well, and the I'm, funny thing is, I, I, when you find out that so, so sometimes the uh, the movie is absolutely just dis- displaying a well documented folklore. Sometimes it's right. Godzilla, which the Japanese producers of that were like, you know, let's make up, let's sure. make up a an island legend, you know. And, 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 and there's usually like a lot of times there'll be a Q and A where somebody will go, somebody will go, oh yeah, well this is totally based on this, it's an actual thing, like. Yes. If you, to, if you go to this village, there's this tale, and you can't escape it. And now, if you go in the, in the village, is big enough now that you know if they sell tchotchkes of this you know, <laughs> legend. Yeah. Or or maybe not. But then there's sometimes where they go, yeah, you know, I heard this tale. It stuck with me. But this is my own version of that because I thought X, Y, and Z was scarier, and this is how I pictured it in my head. Yeah. So those. But how you again? It's how you assimilate the, assimilate those paints into your and put them on your oh, absolutely. canvas. Absolutely that I think is is great, you know, and that difference. But I would like to know more about how much of these monsters are like, no, we I just agree. thought that was cool and amazing. And how much of it is, yeah, I mean, if you- No, I'd love to know. If you, That's if you a really go good here point. and you listen to this tale, these things, you know, if you can hear them, you're dead, right? The, uh, uh, Drew, Drew's right, by the way, that if, because when you think about it, the reason we accept that you can shoot werewolves with silver bullets is because somebody in the story says- well, a silver bullet will take him out or whatever, you know, or that you can stake vampires, you can do whatever because it is because somebody says it in the rules. So they and, do. And a lot of times you'll dig and you'll find out, well, well, well silver was, I, I'm not saying it for this, but a, a tale that could be as, well, silver was very important at this time period. Yeah. And so it became this thing where you wouldn't have a lot of silver and so and so saw this and then it happened and so that turned into silver bullets or stabbing them with silver or a stake you know it had to be ash because you know that had these properties uh yes these medicinal properties so of course it's it it matters what wood it is here but it doesn't matter what wood it is over here because we're so far removed from that well and 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 you accept within the bounds of whatever movie you accept that whatever the, the guy says towards the beginning of the movie is going to be true if you follow those rules towards the end. Right. Like that's just the way movies work. You know, and so a character that can change its shape and turn into mist and not be shot at all can still be shot if it's a certain time of day or if it's a, right. if the if the bullet's made of whatever. Um, they don't do that here. They do say, you know, they're alive so you can kill it and then you just take it for granted. But it, it's true. You could have added like two or three lines of more dialogue saying, um, while they're moving during the daytime, they're going to adopt a certain amount of corporeality that you can shoot. I I you also know. love one of the things I also really dig is once we once the shift happens in like well once it becomes horror, mm-hmm. they decide to to color grade it into almost like negative land. Yeah, that's true. And it becomes a very desaturated, uh, suspenseful thing where they go, this is clearly the realm of these monsters now. In fact, it's, you know, it's nighttime. It becomes brighter, you know, in some ways. And so, and then we leave it, it, we get color back because the, the tail of that. But I, I thought that that switch, it can't, you know, that can be annoying, especially now because there's a trend towards, oh, highly desaturated is Mm -hmm. cool you know or it it adds it does add attention uh but it it can be overused but i think here that kind of thing really sets it because you've got this just bleak surroundings you know desert everywhere um you know and using that scenery but then also color grading it uh you know, with all the shacks and everything like that. I think that was pretty masterfully done. Um, I noticed it more this time because the posters and stuff kind of use that. And then the intro scene that sets the, the kind of where we're headed. 
mm -hmm. has that desaturation, but it wasn't up on rewatch. I was like, oh, well, they used it in this way. I, it seemed a little like it's pretty seamless, but I kind of caught it more this time as, as far as how it was used. And that's why we yeah. rewatch film, I guess, right? Like, oh, absolutely. You, <laughs> you'll catch def different things. And, you know, yeah. Well, by the way, to that point, one thing that I often feel bad about is I, I let play a lot of movies while I'm doing work, right? And yeah. they become almost radio dramas. But it's not a fair – that's only a good way to, like, rewatch something you've already seen a bunch of times. No, I, if, I often uh, will start a film kind of on the, like, hey, I'm interested in this. And I kind of have two tiers. Not that the film is not important enough for my time, um, but if I view it and go there, a lot of times, I mean, most of the time, because I try to respect the filmmaker. I mean, I've sat through movies right by the end. I was like, I did not enjoy that movie. I kind of wanted to walk out, but I don't feel good about doing that, especially at a festival, right? Um, but I I'll, I have a stack of movies that are like 10 to 15 minutes in mm -hmm. uh, that I go that I, you know, some of them I've been watching recently and others are just, you know, on my in my queue that I go, you know what, this film, absolutely, this I, I feel bad if I get this can't be background noise, you know. As, yeah, as this, a, is yeah this is too good. This is too good. So I'm going to put it off until later. Not even, it doesn't even, you know, the, the good part, but like it's it has stuff, right? Like that you need mm -hmm. to pay attention to, even if the even if it's kind of maybe simplistic. It's not like it's it doesn't have to be high art, but it also feels like, you know what? I need to pay attention to this. I, I feel that I should every film should kind of get that. Like I don't go to a movie and then hang out on my phone at the theater why right. should i do that at home oh boy that hurts the way you just said that i know that you didn't but i mean yes i agree and i feel so indicted by that because certainly, well i can't i mean i'm not you know, gonna tell anybody how to you know I, sometimes i will do that. like i'm i'm gonna view this while i'm doing chores it but what I always, in my mind, if I am going to do that, yeah. the way I'm thinking about it is I need to, I'm going to rewatch this in a way that with my undivided attention. Now, there are some movies too. There was a movie I watched the other night where I felt like I liked the look of this film, but I disliked the dialogue and the feel of it. And I would not have felt as bad. Me personally, it does, I, again, uh, I, you know, I don't mean offense to anybody who was making that film. Uh, I probably could have done chores while watching that film because I was not, by the end of it, I was not as happy with it. And I just, mm -hmm. it did not resonate with me, yeah. but it was beautifully shot with really good action sequences. So, you know, I was paying attention to those, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but 15, 20 minutes in, I was like, ooh, this one's a tough one for me to make it through. And I stuck <laughs> through it because the parts that I liked, I liked a lot. The parts that I didn't felt like I don't feel as bad. But your mileage may vary. But I I never feel like I should check out of a film in the theater for some reason. Like that's I'm not no, telling I agree. anybody I'm not telling anybody, you know, what to do in, in your own home for sure. Yeah. But I think and I think that's maybe the past few repertory screenings I went to, and not to go off too much, but I felt like we people even at the draft house, I felt a shift in I, I kinda and doing things in the theater like I do in my living room because I've been in my living room all that Well, long. that's why, by the way... Uh, it drives me nuts. AMC's been playing an ad about that, about how the pandemic has, you know, during the... I'm paraphrasing, which during the pandemic, you may have forgotten some of the rules of being in a theater. And it has, it's actually... And to be honest, what made me delighted about that is it, it feels like we've returned to the time of the 60s when you had uh, industrial shorts and driving yeah, yeah, reminding yeah. people, we're glad you've been touched by the love bug, but there are certain things we don't do in a theater. Now, I mean, that, and yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, just, I went to, I, a, I went to a repertory screening and the person, a few, like, uh, it was a guy and his, I, I'm guessing significant other, and she fidgeted around and like sat, and it was like she was a five. I've seen five year olds better behave than that. How interesting. And it drove me nuts. Like, I, you know, and, I don't want to be a jerk about it, but yeah. you're an adult human. <laughs> and this is a screening of a repertory film that I, I personally really enjoy. Like why, yeah. like this isn't the latest Minions movie or whatever, a very pop culture, you know, yeah. feel good. It, you know, there's a difference between I'm going to go see a movie that isn't shown very often mm -hmm. that's been restored, that has a certain gravity. And I, I, 
I understand that that gravity is that that person didn't have that gravity. That's fine. But why actively go to that and fidget around and act like a five year old? It just yeah, I don't know. Ah, it drives okay. me crazy. Uh, but, can I don't we know. get back to the? Sure, sure, sure. We, sure. Sh- we should absolutely. We should. <laughs> okay, so so the the rest of this film is really a sequence that's much more like recent films like Bird Box or or The Quiet Place, where the tension is drawn from needing to adhere to certain restrictive rules. In this case, you must not allow yourself to hear the monsters. And if mm-hmm. Amy does, it will give you seizures and then and then um, yeah, you'll bleed out. And then you'll like. you'll bleed out and and die and. Uh, and, um, you know, that's a tense bunch of stuff, but there's not really all that much to describe here other than, uh, the, the way the monsters look when they're moving around is a really neat, effective thing because sometimes they're dispersed and then sometimes they gather together into sort yeah, of... Yeah, first it looked like they were like a swarm of locusts and right, then it yeah. kind of looked like le- like leaves in a, in a twister or something like that, but it's really a neat And then sometimes effect. they move like uh, like swarms air, of flies monster, like, yeah. or, or yeah. like a that's person said, like made a of flies. Right, right, yeah. right. right. It, and it that's when you can shoot. Really them. well done too. It fits like the... It fits it's flawless. It theme. looks great. It looks great. <laughs> yeah. You, and this I, is like another reason why I, sometimes I'll see something and I go, well, I'm pretty sure the budget is not the same budget as something right. truly. It doesn't you know, have Hollywood. a Morbius budget. You know, if people yeah. complain about Morbius, but I guarantee you it was a fraction of the budget of Morbius. Yeah, and you'll see these creatures and you're like, again, I want to shake people and go, you get to tell people what they see. Like, yeah. it's your ego and your hubris that says, I have to show this and, and I'm going to crunch all these VFX people but then they don't have enough time to make it good. And then it's going to look like this because I I, <laughs> gave, I took everything from them and they still didn't, I still didn't give enough time. It looks like this. And then you see something for a fraction of that budget that still looks amazing because they knew how to shoot it and said, mm. we can do these things. We have the yeah. budget to do this and we're going to concentrate on that. And it's going to look like this. And it's going to be great because you as the filmmaker get to tell people what they see. <laughs> and and it, it that's another thing that sometimes drives me nuts. Like this looks amazing and you know of course i mean it's a, it's also being a, a really competent filmmaker allows you to to understand and budget and shoot that correctly right mm-hmm. there's, so there's there's skill and talent to that itself um but yeah i think the creatures look great and they're you know, terrifying especially because they're terrifying because they're attacking people and other people that can hear them are getting attacked and then convulsing and bleeding from their you know everywhere <laughs> all their face yeah and just it's but yeah it horrifying. wasn't like, like i said it wasn't super gory like even though no, you get no. the effect of that it's not like they, they didn't put a bunch of money into just having you know all these blood effects it, it was effective in that it was mm-hmm. it, it is it was yeah. horrifying but not gross <laughs> yeah and then we get a lot of sadness where you know one of our team members uh you know has to hold back the the creatures uh mm-hmm. his sacrifice and it, uh, on second viewing i will like i'm kind of with drew like there were some wishy wash wishy wash there was some questions i still had as far as how they worked um mm-hmm. and you know ultimately that sacrifice kind of only buys them some time but it's a really great moment where they're all like look you know because because their camaraderie comes through so much throughout yeah. the film and yeah i thought important. he was gonna get banish them and yeah that was the point and then he didn't i was like oh but also you know gives them time they have they are able to free uh part of the redemption of chaka is he's able to finally free all these uh Children. abuse children uh who would yeah. become soldiers and, and keep being abused he had not done that so he gets to win in that way mm-hmm. but what we learn is you know the whole thing is like hey we got to get on a boat and escape but what we learn is that like they say in the beginning there's foreshadowing that revenge will always kind of come for you mm-hmm. And he's, you know, unfortunately, he's involved his comrades in this revenge. So, you know, we at least lose one of them. But I, you know, that that also is poignant. And all the boat sequence is really good. And then when it kind of switches away from, uh, you know, we're free from the monsters and we switch back. It's just, again, you just look at the scenery, you're like, holy mm-hmm. cow, like that is just, wow. Even, even though it's, you know, kind of a, a wasteland area, it's still just, it makes you, it's beautiful to look at. Well, th- this is a this is a moment we should mention uh, the character of Midnight, who is the one who is the most mystical. He has he has almost mystical powers. He's the one who can do or just sort of energy to healing, dreadlocks. and he, yeah. he he has this He's sort of kind of he has shamanic kind of yes a feel a yeah, vibe to him. 
Yeah, right, he's so what a wonderful character to have him being a a gunslinging, you know, mercenary, but also he has shamanic power. I mean, there's nothing more Marvel Comics than that. <laughs> yeah, that, that... Well, they would have done it probably in a more cringy kind of like, oh, yeah, for no, sure. you're, the, you're like, <laughs> you know, we get this is again why I'm like this. These are the people that tell the story because it's not a white dude who went to Africa one time and then decided to make this movie <laughs> or, or, read a, or, read a, or, read a, or read a few things. Right. Yeah. And I, I love also his his uh you know he's got the powder that puts people to sleep and that's when he doesn't yes. want to shoot them he can do this or, or or you know at the point where he has to go hey we're gonna put you to sleep for this amount of time because we need you like as this decoy thing that all that was great yeah you know? so he holds the um he holds the demons in a sort of a trance and it's 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 amazing at that at that point at that point where where he sort of has them moving it, it reminds me by the way of the birds in a film called cell that was based on a, a stephen king um mm -hmm. novel where where the 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 demons are sort of res they they move in flocks and they kind of respond to the energy of humans and and that's sort of what's going on it's just very special it's and it's so far from where the hell we started with this movie. Right. And, and w one thing I would point out about that also is that in a Hollywood film, and I mean, I challenge people to, to, to prove me wrong on this, but generally, and I know that, you know, I can be, you know, there's all kinds of fallacies, right? If you come up with an example, I can say, well, it doesn't really count. So I'll, I'll try not to cheat with that. But generally speaking, in a Hollywood movie, if you start out with them being drug lords and blah, 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 and then there's a twist and it's a supernatural thing, that twist will happen 30 minutes in tops. Like mm -hmm. it'll happen at the twist. It'll happen at the turn into act two. It will not happen after like 45 minutes. That 15 minutes makes a huge <laughs> difference. Yeah. But um, yeah, anyway. Um, and that's just because we're accustomed to that vocabulary of uh, in, in, you know, American filmmaking. Um, Drew, uh, there was something, and maybe you, may, maybe it was just the thing about the rules, but I had here Drew's comment, and I think it was just about the rules of the, how the monsters worked. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I hit, um, I hit whatever it was that you wanted to talk about. Uh, all right, so that basically brings us, well, I mean, oh, well, the, the part we, we didn't mention is that um, uh, our last couple guys are making it out. Who all is on the boat? finally making it away it's uh chaka and it's um it's awa. the girl uh, awa. awa and who is it just those two or there's one more no is um, there there's also rafa right yeah 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 yeah, yeah. so um and you know so because midnight got taken away and so uh and they almost make it. And one thing that they've established in, in the past, and that's also really unusual, Chuck is afraid of the water. And what's really, really crazy is that he cannot avoid his punishment for the crimes that he commits. You know, he murdered. Well, we might think, by the way, that Omar was perfectly, it was perfectly legitimate to shoot Omar. But right. the demons are going to come get him. He has well, to pay revenge. For his revenge is it? You know, they talk about it's like drowning. Like you, it's its own sin. It's, so it's, somehow, it's revenge a, is its own sin, even if it's just. And yeah. um, you know, and we've seen similar things, even like an EC, our own EC comics, right? Yes. Like this is a different thing, but but that's that all those kind of morality tales. Uh, yeah. Even though you may be justified in destroying evil, at what point are you as evil, or what point does that taint you in a way that that's it for you as well? Yeah. Right. And you know, in this world, that's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, it yeah, it's um, he's he's pulled down by a demon essentially, and it's a I, very I, cool. The water. I really struggle with the with this. The, I I accept that this is the movie where the yeah. movie wants to go, right? But like it, uh, you know, the guy's a child molester, and he's a you know he he uses children as soldiers. Like I, it's where the movie go takes it, and I accept it on that. But like, no, I'm rev I, revenge is you know I I feel like sometimes, in a lot of cases, yes, revenge is is can can be poisonous. I don't know that it is here. Yeah, it's no, daring. I agree with you. It's daring to come to that conclusion for this one, right? I mean, because well, especially because he dies in such an awful way, where he's being dragged right. down by the 
go the kind of the demon ghost of I guess it's Omar is, is who that was. Oh yeah. And um and then the friends are trying to get him pull him back into the boat and you kind of think that they're gonna succeed and then no, he just goes under. It's horrible. It's really horrible. Well and yeah. isn't he now fated to be the new guardian of those demons? So that's that's you think that's what it is? That's really sad. Yeah, to that me. they do say that, yes. Oh. That's right. But that's, hopefully that's he'll very, figure out very a way tragic. to do it. I mean, I hope he doesn't yeah. have to do it by feeding it uh, child soldiers. No, you know? he wouldn't do that. No, I, I drew on this rewatch. I, I know exactly where you're coming from, and I struggled a little bit. And then, I, like you're saying, though, the, the point and the layers of the movie dictate that that is where it goes. And also, you know, it strikes that kind of, I think everybody, everybody agrees, like, yes. Let's shoot the child molesting the horrible soldier guy in the face as many rounds as can a revolver can hold. Yeah, like we're all good with that, and that is justified. Like you have stopped. He's his own demon. He's a human. It's just the yeah. worst of a human. And he, in fact, he's he's uh, again what I see the true mark of evil. We don't think of him as evil. He's able to pass himself off as not evil. Yeah, and that that's the true evil. That's when when people talk about what evil is. That's that's where it really hits me. Are these uh, the the true terrible people, the true evil of the world, are the people who convince others that they are not this just despicable scum because they have influence because they can twist that you know and that's been legends from time you're not, War, but you're not talking about the political landscape by any chance, are you? No, no, I, actually, I'm not. I mean, it yes, uh -huh. but. Yes, but I mean, but but truly, you know, we, we've seen dictator after dictator also be able to do like, you know, th this is something that happens. But but when I think of these, what I think of as evil is different than, you know, oh, it's some, you know, red demons with goatees, right? Yeah. <laughs> or, or whatever, like the, the true reality, the reality of our evil in our devoid of supernatural uh, influence is a person like Omar who can get away for most of their life by being just the best host. He's so nice, you know. Oh, yeah. well, uh, oops, he's got child soldiers that he molests in a shed. Yeah. Dozens of them. But he's such a nice host. He gave yeah. his wine. And he, oh, look, we had a great time. Um, You know, the, the woman and her, you know, the musicians, <laughs> you're like, oh, we, you know, we did some chores and, you know, four-star review on uh yeah you know, whatever online you know, five-star review or whatever <laughs> online thing you know and you, know, omar, you can't say enough good things about our host omar right if if things hadn't gone cr wild right like you could see that happening yeah. um and 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 the the way that the true evil gets away with that so yeah. i i we're not we don't ever disagree with that but the point of the legend and the in the in the the story here like i agree with you drew but i i accepted it more this time like oh well i mean there's kind of no in in this tale in the world where that revenge is still a thing not to be lauded is deeper in some ways because in a lot of tales that revenge is so justified that we we you know put our hands together wipe go yep good old revenge for for the good of everything and you know again i think omar should get <laughs> That yeah. that person needs to not be here. And, and there are a lot Earth. of movies, a lot of movies where the story, where the moral is, if we kill that person, then we're just like him. We we've yeah. stooped his level or whatever. Yeah. And sometimes so, you do it anyway. I mean, there are other exactly. movies I can think of where the person does the thing that they need to do for their own destiny, but they also get chopped up by a helicopter I, or, or whatever, you know. I think, though, to Drew's point and, and Julia as well, the tragedy comes from that Chaka doesn't exactly realize, like, he knows that the stakes are there, but it's never kind of, it's not until the very end that that becomes the reality. Like, there's not a lot of, there's not, there's foreshadowing in when you watch it objectively but to him it seems like i mean why wouldn't you do that and then yeah. we we come to find out like well there's look you still have to pay and yeah. and i i'm with i understand exactly where you're coming from drew but i like i said on the second watch i still struggle with it a little bit and then kind of went you know that's i, I i'm made my peace with it in a way well you know? and i do yeah. i do take the movie on its own terms ultimately right. like it's it, it didn't ruin the movie for me obviously but sure. like you know we're, we're here discussing it and uh -huh. no, you no. know i i i 
I'm just trying to add to the discussion the best I can. No, oh, no, no, no. no. I, I think you're, I think, like, like I said, I, I totally know because I didn't remember that as well. I'm like, oh man, that is just, yeah, yeah, but because, yeah, because Omar shouldn't be here. Like, he's yeah. that, that evil gets too often in the world, evil gets away with all of this crap, right? Yeah. And boy, and that's why we watch movies a lot of times is that because catharsis of you know what it is great that the bad guy lost in fact i lately i watch more movies that aren't as ambiguous Mm -hmm. (laughs) like yes i'm totally cool with the good guys even if they're you know kind of on the shady side sometimes the good guys winning cool in the game yeah uh but you know i i I probably watch a little bit less of a a ending like this (laughs) it's not quite as satisfying because i'm so tired of evil winning so often in reality mm-hmm. uh yeah i, so I think it, i think it's a great i think that's a great discussion drew like you're totally yeah. I'm, I'm with you all right so we should we should yeah. close it out we should get our yeah. final thoughts if we have any left uh the um but uh tony we start with you um so uh you know i don't know is, if there's anything you would like to add but uh, uh go ahead yeah i mean on, on second viewing um I, like I said, I wish if I, if I had known that I, there could be interviews, I would have done those at the last Fantastic Fest. I'm glad that it's out. Uh, I think it's really fantastic. It's, it's really cool to see a bunch of reviews come through, you know, people watching on Twitter. Uh, I would love to have a Blu-ray or, for, or UHD of this just to rewatch it for all the cool scenes. And, you know, if there, especially, what is it, if there's... Wait, excuse my ignorance, what is a UHD? Uh, 4K. So what the film, it? it's, it's a 4K disc. Like you, it's Blu-ray, it's, yeah, it's a, a UHD. I, I have to look up the acronym, but like, um, it's it's basically a 4K Blu-ray. What do you do? You, what uh, do you play it on a Blu-ray player? Yeah, I have a 4K. I mean, you 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 have to have a Blu-ray player that can, uh, can play. It? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, but um, yeah, it's actually yeah, it's at uh slightly short of actual true 4K. Um, it's like three three thousand eight hundred forty. Yeah, that's all geeky. Business. Yep. But anyway, uh <laughs> there's a bunch like it's right. I I have a feeling that's gonna be kind of the last, like UHD will kind of be the last uh physical, physical. media kind yep. of thing. I mean there might be, but but it yeah. Yep. But U- UHD is the disc you can get true 4K usually by streaming. Mm. Okay. Anyway, that's that's the answer. <laughs> but I like getting ultra HD is basically it's it's just it's that ultra HD is is what it means. Oh, okay. But Eight. yeah, it's it's uh but I, I've been getting a lot more, you know, ultra HD discs to to watch uh when I can. And there's some really, really good ones. Like the I mean it's it's nice. Because my internet connection sucks big time. So I can't stream 4K anything. I'm lucky if I get macro blocky. Anything that says it's gonna be 4K is gonna look like it's gonna be at a good resolution as if you then took that resolution and put it twice through YouTube. <laughs> Not every time, but but I've I've seen some lately that have done that and it makes me sad. But anyway, so if I play it through my player, I'm always gonna get that slightly under 4K. Anyway, I yeah, I, I want I want a Blu-ray of this, something fierce. I hope hmm. that uh yeah it, it would be nice if there was a native one with you know i would love one with commentary and behind the scenes stuff because i think there's a lot to this but uh yeah i look forward to you know it's on shutter so i look forward to, to watching it a couple more times at least in the near future awesome uh julia did you have any uh, any final thoughts i mean it's been a good conversation i i agree um that the ending was really disturbing um and uh, it perplexing to me because I don't know. I just, yeah, I'm still thinking like, even as we're talking about, I was thinking, okay, well, so what does it mean? Um, but uh, yeah, it's very thought provoking, very interesting commentary. I, I would be interested. I was kind of, poking around the internet well after tony after you mentioned uh, i wonder if it's based on any real folklore and i haven't found specific things i did find some th- just stuff about senegalese superstitions and folklore um and there was some yeah. stuff about uh you know just n- like nature you know like uh be- feel- mm-hmm. feeling like um like uh let's see where was what this thing that i wanted to read to you i mean um, i kind of poked around too but i would i i wish i could you yeah know, there wasn't anything more yeah, point, like, hey so where did this come did, from did, you know it did talk about, you know, don't go inside at Lake One. So there's definitely some things that are like, you know, that you can kind of see where it might have come from. It's like, don't sit under certain kinds of trees or at certain times or whatever. 
Right, but um, right. so I, I could see it. But anyway, um, but it's all very interesting. I, I'm uh, I'm fascinated uh, as uh, by other cultures and other countries, as you would hope I would be, given that that's my like job to work with uh, immigrants. But um, so uh, yeah, I, I love stuff like that. So it's it was definitely interesting and thought provoking in a lot of ways. Um, and sad, you know, all the I mean, gosh, the trafficking of children or the abuse of children is always like the worst thing you can possibly think of so um absolutely that was heartbreaking but uh yeah a very interesting um film so thanks for bringing it to us thank you julia uh drew what about you um you know i i was mostly quiet and i feel like the stuff i was saying was kind of oddly critical which might give the impression that i didn't like this movie which is actually absolutely not true I enjoyed it a lot. I think it's a very well shot, well acted, different kind of movie. And, you know, I don't, uh, I don't hope any of my criticisms keep people from checking it out because I do a hundred percent think that this is something that people should check out. I think it's good discussions, man. I think, you know, everything you said is, Hey, this is how I felt. And, and they, Form good discussion so i i don't know yeah, I, I didn't think it was i exactly appreciate that, that but i don't think either. that i don't i wouldn't worry about that uh as far as like that's why we all i mean in normal thing we get coffee after a film and talk about these same things and we just do this virtually so i think that's cool it's crazy uh and for me i i couldn't add anything more except for that uh this was just an example of the kind of and I don't work for Shutter, okay? But it is an example of the kind of surprising things that Shutter will have because they'll just they just yeah have I'm so glad just so many different things on Shutter and it's amazing. So, um, so there you go. Uh, all right, uh, and I I know that we're gonna this and it's gonna be a really neat few weeks leading up to Halloween with some really surprising, both old school stuff like going back to going back to universal horror and some newer things and some deep vault stuff from the eighties. So I'm, I'm excited. I really am, but you will learn more about what we're going to be, be doing. Um, but first let's get our endorsements for the week. It's been several weeks, so you can talk about anything recently that you've been into that you want to share. Um, starting with Tony, what do you got? Oh, I I'm drawing a blank because most of my focus is now like, I'm going to endorse fantastic fest because we're going to be talking about that. And that's how I became upon this movie. Um, there's a lot of really cool movies uh, there. And there's also a Fantastic Fest at home component that actually offers a lot in, you know, one of my favorites that I'm super stoked about Shin Ultraman ends up on the Fantastic Fest uh, at home. So I'm super stoked actually to see that at the theater. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sad because I want to cover as many new movies coming out for the podcast for, for you know, since I'm doing press stuff and since we're going to be doing reviews, uh, be doing audio reviews, uh, AGFA, American, uh, you know, the American genre film, um, is going to show a bunch of secret screenings, but I'm covering other movies. And so it's a double-edged sword of, you know, wanting to do press and wanting to, to cover a lot of cool new stuff. Uh, I also wish I could clone myself and go watch all the repertory things that AGFA's going to show because they have some just awesome things um but yeah as far as pop culture stuff i mean we're watching she hulk i've been watching i've been watching a lot of stuff uh you know the new lord of the rings show is beautiful um just you know breathtaking in, in many respects um and i'm kind of in the i'm in the neutral tolkien like i like the books but i'm not as much of a nerd as mm -hmm. like other friends of mine so i'm kind of in the middle you know yeah um and so i'm okay with some things changing and i'm interested where it goes and stuff like that um i also hbo max so one cool thing that i had forgotten about is you know there's the hbo max all the news like they have that bar of these are the new things that came out well if you go up <clears throat> and you say i want to see all of them then you get all the rep all the old stuff that they yeah. have added so like there's one like operation crossbow like world war ii uh thing and there's you know all this stuff all the thin man stuff mm -hmm. hey new this month oh wait well you can watch all the thin man <laughs> movies Yes. But they don't show up as, you know, in the same, hey, we also added the new, El you know, we added Elvis. Yeah. So you have to search for it a little bit. 
And, you know, who knows what's going to happen, how much of that's going to go away, because they have a new head of all of that who seems to be ter- determined to make reality TV as important as the cultural history of film. And you can, <laughs> you can probably hear I mean, my we'll... disdain. And you know, whatever, I mean, I look, it, it's what pays for things and keeps the lights on and we'll production see what crews happens. work on well, that. Honestly, but... you know, God only knows. I, I mean, I, I, you know, I worked for Warner Brothers under AT and T when I was at Rooster Teeth, so I, you know, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Um, but I, I thought that was cool because I started, you know, I went and started searching around a little bit and more. I was like, oh man, there's all this cool stuff that I had forgotten was getting added per month. Uh, so like it doesn't, it's not maybe as extensive as Amazon because it's kind of specific to you know warner brothers or and their affiliates uh but there's some really cool stuff up in there if you look around so i i suggest if you have the service to kind of poke around a little bit more in there uh and then in what's new i mean there's still the uh, archive of just you can watch all of these movies but if you just look at what's on the front screen, you know, the front interface, you're, you're kind of missing out on, on cool things. So I'm yeah. going to leave it at that. And then, you know, hopefully people will, I hope that listeners, if you've made it this far, will take a look at Fantastic Fest and go, hey, what what about this? Are you covering that? What's this like? Um, and I'll let you know, you know, there's two secret screenings as well. So I'll be able to, you know, depending on embargo, some things are embargoed. Um, so we'll see how that happens. But uh, I hope to be able to bring you new cinema uh, recommendations throughout the week. And I'll be not part of the podcast this coming Sunday, but I think the next one. So after the 30th, so what's the first? Uh, I should be back. Excellent. Uh, Julia, what about you? Gosh, it's been so long. I can't even remember what all I've taken in. Um, I know I went down a uh, rabbit hole of listening to all of the episode, old episodes, or back episodes, I should say, not old, of the podcast Smart List. <laughs> Because it's so funny, uh, and, and and a lot of the guests are really interesting. It's a, a podcast that um, Jason Bateman, Sean Hayes, and um, Will Arnett do, and they interview like different guests. Anyway, I just find it hysterical and interesting, and I, I don't know, it's really fun. Um, so I listen to those, but uh, um, like movies wise, we uh, just went to see um, a whodunit. Um, it's called uh, See How They Run, right? Is that the name? See How They Run? Uh, Jason? Uh, yeah, I think the, that's right. I think that's right. I think that's right. Anyway, uh, so that was a fun, fun little picture. Kind of, kind of has a Wes Anderson feel to it, but it's not, it's not Wes Anderson. Um, you know, it's not uh, super like creative, but it has some cute stuff to it. Uh, there was definitely a, a fun, um, like a fun, uh, you know, sort of gimmick that it has going. But anyway, so that was neat. But now I can't think of anything that I've just really um, loved recently, aside from, like I say, going down the, the smart list. Sure. <laughs> Rabbit hole. Well, that's a good tip. Uh, and, and yeah, see how they run. I actually did enjoy that a lot, especially because mm. of of characters like Richard Attenborough and, and Agatha Christie showing up. I mean, that was, yeah. that was neat. Um, Drew, what about you? Um, for whatever reason, I seem to have become momentarily obsessed with zombie films that came out in between Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead. So, oh, interesting. Um, what I've been watching is i watched the you know two of the the blind dead movies um, oh great yeah great. and i i in particular though the i think out of the lot that i've i've watched my favorite uh was revisiting uh a movie i used to own a copy of this and i i sold it and now i find myself regretting it but it's a a movie called the the living dead in manchester morgue uh Mm -hmm. also known as let sleeping corpses lie and Mm -hmm. it's it's on shutter right now and it's really good it's not a you know a zombie movie you see brought up that much but it's also just interesting to see where it falls in the way the tropes are utilized because um 
is you know night of the living dead was like this lightning rod and now there's like all these imitators that came out after it and then dawn of the dead comes out and it's sort of the trope codifier um but this th- what's interesting about watching these these movies that sort of come out in between is that the 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 rules aren't really completely solidified so they're they're you know they're just making making up their own logic of of the dead coming back and eating corpses but uh, the the living the living dead in Manchester morgue has probably my favorite kind of scenery, which is this like green, um, but overcast and and it, so it's 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 kind of gloomy at the same time and it uh you know so there's there's a lot of you know i said scenery porn about this this uh, this movie tonight but there's a lot of scenery porn in that and it's also just it's just an interesting cool movie that i think has fallen uh, off a lot of people's radar but it's on shutter right now and I recommend checking that one out. And if you're able to track them down, I do also recommend checking out the Blind Dead movies because, you know, it's it's just it's a worthy thing to do. Very cool. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, drawing on, on what you just said, uh, I love looking at films that have sort of fallen out of fallen out of the conversation. And I, I got this move. I got this book at the library through interlibrary loan not long ago called Zombie that I remember borrowing when i was a kid it was about zombie movies and it came out back in 1976 it was already an old book when i borrowed it as a kid but it listed and talked about many many films that i'd literally like either only heard of once or twice or never heard of and so i wrote them all down and what i've been doing is slowly but surely working my way through them you know so i it, and it's been a blast because earlier this week i watched frankenstein's bloody terror which is a paul nashy werewolf movie uh and um i'm now about to start night of the devils which is a, a early 1970s italian demon movie so you know and these are movies that just don't get mentioned very much and the reason why is that in the intervening 50 years there's just many more films to discuss and so writers are referring to other stuff but sometimes things fall through the cracks and you go wow that was really interesting so i'm i'm having a good time excavating a lot of that i also wanted to mention i went out julia and i went out tonight to a special pop-up uh store put on by vinegar syndrome and uh, their uh, marketing director, Teresa Mercado, at a brand new store in Aurora, Colorado, called the Archive Colorado. And it's this store is just all about physical media, about used DVDs and, awesome. and puzzles. Uh, Tony, you weren't able to buy puzzles yet because they, they the only thing they were selling was stuff in the Vinegar Syndrome collection. But these guys had all they had like a Lucio Folky Zombie Two puzzle with a oh, thousand man. pieces. Oh. Speaking of vinegar <laughs> syndrome, we watched uh, New York Ninja. Oh yeah, which was, and that the tale of New York Ninja. It was a found movie that was found without any of the sound elements, mm. unedited. So vinegar syndrome <laughs> edited it, recast it, re-recorded the sound. But it's a baffling movie. It, it's there's so much awesome action eighties ninja ness in it, and all the villains. I, <laughs> I don't, and I don't mean to, to to take over, but like I just remembered that, no, that was sounds, one of the things because it what it feels like is you know when you had when you were if it was in the eighties and you were playing arcade beat 'em up games like mm-hmm. Final Fight and uh, Double Dragon and uh, you know uh, Streets of Rage. Well, there were those games that were kind of like Capcom made some you know like like big big name companies made beat these beat em ups and then mm-hmm. you had a bunch of people who were like i would also like to make that money and they tend to be way more kind of just bizarre like the cast of characters were kind of ripoffs of the final fight streets of rage kind of characters but they were weirder because their designers were not those same artists and all of the the street gangs in this movie nobody seems to wear clothes the way normal people you know lots of jock straps on top of pants mm-hmm. and masks and just <laughs> random like just just Everybody see like all the gangs that it's it's the New York from a beat 'em up a, a knockoff beat 'em up by a side company that wasn't Capcom or Konami is what it feels like but in in movie form <laughs> and it and vinegar syndrome i mean they knocked out of the park as far as the presentation of like the New York ninja like the the box and everything um 
That's I heard awesome. there was some controversy that I didn't know about until after I'd watched it, but uh, but just man, it is. I, they don't know if for a fact that the ending is the ending. It's got a, a villain that can be exposed to radiation, but then it deforms him, but also powers him. And you know, the fashions are definitely the eighties. Uh, all the like, like I said, all all of it. It just had this flavor of an off-brand beat 'em up, in the same way that it's kind of an off-brand ninja movie. There's That's a part where the ninja is wearing roller skates and he fights like well, roller skates, roller skates, because it's the '80s, right? Like, oh yeah, and and not just roller skates, but like brown ones, like the ones that if you if you can't buy fancy roller skates, <laughs> uh, one of the guys wears a <laughs> band, a band like the ones you rent, like. Uh, you know, I'm gonna have to check out skates and spray a bunch of spray extra of that the foot stuff in there. But one of the one of the guys has like a band jacket with like a Van Halen patch on the side. That's his like villain attire at some point. It's all this stuff, man. That's just the fact that it even got made that they found the movie, re-edited it, and put it back out with you know redubbed it everything it's it it's such a great thing. And when you mention vinegar syndrome, I think they just do such cool stuff. Oh, absolutely that yeah. i just that, that just you know sorry to, to to hijack your endorsement but no 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 that so, came up and i was like oh man that's just it was just such an, an enjoyable craziness uh well, they do they do yeah they do wonderful work so yeah they had lots of product at this place and uh so yeah it's called um it, it's called the archive colorado and it's in aurora and i walked out what did i get i got Friday Thirteenth Part Three in 3D with glasses. Oh, and nice! I, and I got um, an Agfa horror trailer Blu-ray that uh, I cannot oh, wait to start to start watching. I mean, I have actually started watching it, and already. Oh, those I'm, trailer just, ones wonderful. are great. Those trailer ones are are amazing. You, yeah, I yeah. love that. Um, there, the Vinegar Syndrome Cloak and Dagger also is just. I don't know if you've seen that, but it. Oh, I've, I've seen the art. And, it's and just it looked, beautiful. It's gorgeous. Yeah. So. Anyway, so that's that's my endorsement. We had a we had a really fun time. So um, awesome, cool. and, and that store is not even quite open yet. So I presume it opens like any day now because they've been they've been rushing. And so I'll definitely go back at some point to get a Lucio Fulci pulse uh, puzzle. So um, Man, all right, cool. well, thank you everyone, and we will be back really soon to usher us all uh, through the Halloween season. So. Um, um, you know, be kind to one another. Thanks, everybody. Night. Night. Night.